Well, good evening to you all. Good to see you out on uh, this wintry night, but it is warm and nice in here. We are blessed with that right now, blessed with uh, good people and good fellowship and a good time. We also welcome those of you on Facebook Live. Thank you so much for joining us. I do want to say especially uh, that this Sunday morning, uh, we, the choir will be presenting their Christmas cantata. It is entitled The First Noel. And so that's this Sunday, December the 17th, during our 11 o'clock a.m. morning worship service. So uh, please come out, make plans to attend. There are also, for those of you here, there are still some little sheets out on the table in the foyer. Uh, take some of those with you. Maybe pass them around to people you come in contact with and invite them to our cantata, the first Noel. Now also this Sunday evening, we're having our youth Christmas play. And uh, Susan, Susie, what is the name of our kids play? No Vacancy. All right, so come out at 530 this Sunday evening, support our kids and youth, and they've been practicing also for weeks, like our choir's been practicing for months now and getting ready for this night, so make sure that you make plans to come and be with us in-house for both of those wonderful times of worship and song and narration. May the Lord bless you for doing so. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, and we thank you for this time of year. We thank you, Lord, for the joy that we can experience when we know you as our Savior. We thank you for coming to us, Heavenly Father, and putting on our flesh and humbling yourself in a mighty, mighty way, a way that is hard for us to comprehend, and yet that is the joy of our salvation. Lord, help us to rejoice uh, not only tonight, but also, Heavenly Father, throughout this season. May that carry over into our new year. Give each person the strength that they need in their certain and specific circumstances, O Lord, and just bless them with your mercy and grace. And God, as the song wonderfully says, and fit us for heaven, to be with you there. Bless this evening, Heavenly Father, as we look into your word. Help us to open our minds and our hearts, and may your Holy Spirit be free to speak to us. And, O oh God, as we sing praises unto you, receive our praises, and may it be a sweet-smelling sacrifice at the throne of heaven. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, and all of his children said together, Amen. Brother Brandon. Good evening. It says in Luke 2, 17 through 18, they reported the message they were told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed. So with that, let us stand and we'll sing our hymn for tonight. It'll be 198, What Child Is This? We'll sing all three verses. What child is Oh, 
Well, I'm so thankful that you are here tonight for uh, the Christmas devotion here on December the 13th. And tonight's thought of, or is, the humility of the Savior. We're going to be looking at several different scriptures tonight uh, to look at the humility of Jesus Christ. And beginning, we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. But I will be moving through several scriptures rather swiftly. If uh, you desire, you can, of course, look at those on the screen and write those down. And maybe you might want to look at those a little later in your private devotion time before the evening. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. Now what do we mean here? Well, one, of course, Jesus was not a rich man upon this earth that we know of. And matter of fact, other things show us that he wasn't, especially when he began his ministry. But it means he became poor in that he humbled himself uh, to the point of putting on our flesh and bone. Again, he veiled his glory. He veiled his glory. So he became poor by putting on flesh so that you by his poverty... Now, that means a spiritual poverty that we have. That means we are lost and undone and in need for a Savior. And so let's read that again. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich in the splendor of heaven, yet for your sake he became poor, he veiled his glory, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Amen. Well, there are many wonderful things to consider at Christmas time in dealing with the birth of Jesus as we celebrate the coming of God in the flesh, which is an amazing thought itself, isn't it? Um, each time that I say that, I'm still in amazement of that phrase, that God in the flesh. What an amazing thought. This wasn't just a good man that was born. Not even just a godly man, as we might use that term in our world. But this is God, God who came in the flesh of mankind. And so we should still be amazed at the humility that God demonstrated in his first visit to earth to accomplish our redemption. I'm amazed at how low, if you will, God stooped to rescue us. Philippians 2 and chapter in chapter 2 and verses 1 through 11, it's a familiar passage to many of us, but it is important to look at tonight as we consider this thought of the humility of the Savior. Philippians says this, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Lead each, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of man. That verse 7 is key. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, again, to think that God would allow himself to be confined to human flesh and bones is absolutely amazing. 
And this is definitely something to wonder at and to think upon in our Christian life, and especially, again, we do that this time of year. It was mankind that had fallen through disobedience. And so a man had to pay the price and become a sacrifice to redeem lost man. It was, if you will, a legal, legal matter in heaven. And so God had to come in the flesh as a man to save mankind from fa their fallen condition and restore fellowship with God. Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 14 through 17 says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he, being Jesus, himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not the angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. And therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And so there again, that explains why God had to come in the flesh. He partook of the same things that we have to partake of in this life, and he did more. He went beyond. And so at Christmas, we're in awe of how God chose humble and lowly Mary and Joseph uh, to be Jesus's earthly parents. I think few people could be chosen for that because pride would not allow them to do what Joseph and Mary did. God knew that. And it's also interesting that simple shepherds were the first to visit the newborn king uh, along with the livestock in the barn and not the royalty in Jerusalem. It's an amazing thought that Jesus was born in a stable and laid in an animal trough in little Bethlehem and not born in the palace in Jerusalem. All of these sp things speak of the child in the manger, the humility of God. I thought of that precious little hymn, sometimes we sing this time of year, called Child in a Manger. It's to the tune of another well-known hymn of the church. But listen to the words. Child in the manger, infant of Mary, outcast and stranger, Lord of all. What an amazing thought. Child in who, who inherits all our transgressions, all our demerits on him fall, the befall. And so there again we see through the hymn writer, he took upon himself our sins, our ugliness, our unholiness. Verse 2 of that hymn says, Once the most holy child of salvation, gentle and lowly, lived below. Now as our glorious, mighty Redeemer, see him victorious o'er each foe. And Jesus Christ conquered death so that you and I would have the power and the sting of death removed from our lives. Hallelujah. Amen to the Lord God Almighty. Well, these are all just signs as to how God came to relate to us as human beings and show, again, the humility that he revealed to us as a Savior. In fact, not only is Jesus our Savior, but he is our model for humility. And he shows us how we should strive to live at Christmas time, yes, but also year around, year after year in our Christian life of faith. Jesus took the form of a servant, it said in Philippians, and we as Christians are commanded to have that same mindset. And so let us not forget the promise that Jesus himself spoke in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 5, where he said, blessed, and that word also means happy. Happy are the humble. This is from the CSB I'm reading. Blessed or happy are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Can I say this? That much of our unhappiness in life comes from our lack of humility and from not having the servant mindset of Jesus Christ. Would you agree with that statement? Amen. I, I would certainly see that in my life. And so let us return to the birth narrative now to keep seeing ways in which the humility of the king, this king Jesus, was displayed. I go now to Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 13 and reading through verse 15. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, 
and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And so Jesus might be from an infant, maybe up to two years of age. We don't know exactly what his age is here. He's in a house. The wise men have come, and that's who the angel told, uh, told to go a different route. And they uh, revealed, and the angel revealed to them that Herod was lying. And we know that Herod sent out troops to kill those in Bethlehem of two years of age and under. And so now here the angel speaks to Joseph, telling him, get out of there and take the child and go into Egypt. Now verse 14, and he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Now let's go again back to Matthew 2 and verse 19 through 22. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. In verse 22, But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And so here we see Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, they had to flee. And they had to be strategic in their life and travels to keep Jesus and themselves safe from those who would do him harm. And so we see how God guided them <clears throat> and spoke to them with warnings along the way and direction on where to go and where to stay for what period of time. But notice that God, even though this was God in the flesh, the word that had become flesh, he did not keep them from the frustration of moving and anxious field nights as there were those who would be hostile towards this young baby Jesus. And so again, we see the humble and lowly life that even as an infant, a young Jesus had to experience in becoming our savior. They had to be on the move. Hebrews chapter five and verse eight says this, although he, Jesus, was a son, he learned obedience through what he what? Suffered, yes. So following the nativity, we see where Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, now they settled in Nazareth. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 23. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophet, prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Now let's think about that for a moment. This too showed the humbleness in which Christ would show to all that would behold him. The term Nazarene was actually one of reproach and not a term of pride and good standing. John chapter 1 and verses 43 and through 46, we get a picture of this as Jesus is calling those earthly disciples to follow him. And in verse 43, it says the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and all the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And so here it's proclaimed that he's the Messiah. He's the one they've been looking for. He is Jesus of Nazareth. Nathanael said to them, him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That was their mindset. How's the Savior going to come out of Nazareth? Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. And Philip said to him, come and see. Nathanael could not understand why the Savior of his people could come from lowly Nazareth. And yet, Jesus was often called Jesus of Nazareth throughout the scriptures. It was in Nazareth where our Lord would grow up and it would be the city in which he identified himself with. Years ago, I recorded a song entitled Sweet Nazarene. 
And I love the song. I've not sung it in many years. But the gentleman that was playing the keyboard for me while we were in the studio asked me what that song meant. I'll be honest, it took me a little by surprise. And while I gave an answer to the sweetness and tenderness and kindness of Christ, I didn't feel that I gave a good answer off the cuff. And now looking back, I would reflect that how the song shows the humility of God in the flesh to be called a Nazarene. Beloved, think of the lowliest or maybe the most unpopular uh, and disliked place that some might be embarrassed to call home and then having that place tied to your heritage throughout your whole life. And then you begin to see what it meant for Jesus to be called Jesus of Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel asked. Yes, the sweet Nazarene, the Savior of the world that came to us from our sin. The humility of the king is certainly something to admire, and it is certainly something for each child of God that's been sealed with the Holy Spirit to imitate in our life. Micah, the prophet Micah, chapter 6 and verse 8 says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Well, Joseph, Mary, the shepherds, and the wise men all had to humble themselves and worship the king who left the glories and splendor of heaven and humbled himself all the way to the cross of Calvary. And so this Christmas and in this new year that is fastly approaching upon our heels, may we learn and relearn humility more and more. Pride is something that we never totally conquer in this life. It is something that is always needing to be dealt with. And so let us walk wisely as our Lord walked upon this earth in humility and humbleness. Someone once said this, Humility isn't thinking less of yourself, but is thinking of yourself less. I think that's a good description. Now C.S. Lewis in his book Mere Christianity wrote this, If anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. If you think you are not conceited, it means you are very conceited indeed. And so in other words, I believe what C.S. Lewis, who had a much greater mind than mine, is saying that genuine humility isn't being proud of your humility. Amen? We don't say I'm proud of my humility or we are very conceited. The way to true humility is found only in and through the life of Jesus Christ, living a life of faith and trust in him. It takes faith in God to be genuinely humble. Would you agree with that? Because so many circumstances that crop up or arise in our life, we have to be genuinely humble and we need the help of the Lord to do that. And so we can be humble one day and the next day when a certain problem or conflict arises, we have to deal with that pride matter all over Again, and that's a matter of faith because we have to trust God in that circumstance. God, I know I've been slighted, so to speak. I've been overlooked. Uh, I've been ignored. I'm going to trust you with this. I'm going to trust you with this circumstance and trust that you know all things that I need. And so, before we come to a large and unknown gap in the life of Jesus Christ uh, from the age of 12 beyond all the way up until he was baptized by John in the Jordan, we are again given a glimpse of the humility of Jesus when he was 12 years of age and had come to Jerusalem, maybe for his first time. And in Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52, we read to many of us a familiar story of the boy Jesus in the temple. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey 
But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. In verse 51, I love this. Here we see the humility of Jesus Christ, a young boy, different than most 12 year olds wouldn't you agree with that and it said and he went down with them and came to Nazareth there again that lowly place to be from and the scripture said and was submissive to them God in the flesh was submissive to Mary and Joseph and his mother treasured up all these things in her heart and then in verse 52 it says and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man how did he do that oh my goodness it came through humility now as we come to a close tonight may we also submit ourselves to God and walk in humility as Jesus Christ himself walked while he was among us amen and as we take time to reflect upon Jesus this Christmas let us be amazed at how our Lord humbly left heaven and identified with us in our human nature to rescue us from sin, death, and hell. He did all of that through humility. The grace that has been given to us through this humble king should cause us, cause within our hearts a very great and genuine humility that God of all gods, Lord of all lords, king of all kings, has come and put on my flesh and went to the cross bearing my sin and my shame, conquering death and is preparing a place for all those that know him. And may we be in awe of his humility and may we identify ourselves with Jesus as our Lord and Savior. To God be the glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are in awe tonight and rejoice in what you have done. We are in awe of how humbly you walked among us while in our flesh, all the way to the cross and beyond. Lord, we know that one day when you will return, when you came, you came as a sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God. But when you return, you will return as a conquering lion, the king of Judah, the Lord of all creation. Until that day, O Lord, as we continue to walk in faith and help us to follow in your footsteps, help us through the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts to remain humble and to walk in humility and to trust you in all things. Now again, O Lord, this is something that we always have to deal with in our Christian life. So guard our hearts and our minds, Heavenly Father, and lead us in the way everlasting a way that the rest of the world is not walking. So help us to walk on the narrow path that leads to you and to our eternal home in heaven. Lord, again, I thank you for those that have come tonight, for those watching on Facebook, and I pray, Lord, that you bless them in a very real and wonderful, wonderful way, not only this Christmas, but as we enter into a new year. We trust you, we love you, we thank you, we rejoice in you, O Lord. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, thank you for those of you on Facebook Live for joining us tonight and maybe for sharing this so that others can hear the message. Again, let me remind you, this Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, we're having our Christmas cantata. It's entitled The First Noel. So come out and be with us in person, if at all possible. We do have Sunday school at 10 that many of our people enjoy. We hope you'll get involved in that. And then again, our youth Christmas play is going to be at 5.30.
this Sunday evening, so may we all make plans to be at both services. Let me also add that we will be here Christmas Eve morning, Sunday school at 10, worship at 11, and we're looking forward to a wonderful time in the Lord. I hope that you'll take time out of your Christmas schedule to worship the Lord on the Lord's Day on Christmas Eve, and may you keep Christ in your Christmas. God bless you. Bye-bye.